بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تمسك بسنته إلى يوم الدين ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته my dear brothers and sisters now what I'm going to speak about today in this recording is regarding Orientalist Scholarship versus Islamic Scholarship. Orientalist Transmission of Knowledge versus Islamic Transmission of Knowledge. Now I have chosen to speak about this topic because of the interview between Yasser Qadi, Hadahullah, may Allah guide him, and Muhammad Hijab as well, Hadahullah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide him as well. So, basically, because of the interview between Yasser Qadi and Muhammad Hijab, a lot of controversy has arisen. And the Islamophobes, the Christians, the atheists, and apostates, are all celebrating online they are all celebrating on youtube and they are looking to keep this in the front burner to give the muslims even more doubts now right now i'm not going to address yasir Qadi himself i'm going to address the issues that orientalism has with the transmission of Islamic knowledge, in particular, the oral transmission of Islamic knowledge. Now, the whole thing about it is that one of the conditions of the recitation of the Quran is that it must have an authentic chain of narration. It must have an authentic senad, an authentic chain of narration. What is meant by that is that the Quran has to be transmitted from teacher to student to teacher to student, from teacher to student, and when that student becomes a teacher, he teaches his student and it goes on like that. Because Allah sent it to Jibreel alayhi salam, Jibreel sent it to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam taught his companions and the companions radiallahu ta'ala anhum taught the generation after them who are called the tabi'un and the tabi'un um, taught the adba tabi'in and the prophet's companions uh, it reached up to about um, to about more than a hundred thousand so the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught them the book of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they taught others the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who came after them and then those who came after taught those who came after them so basically the foundation upon which Quranic recitation is based upon is oral transmission oral recitation oral rendition this is what it is based upon now the whole thing about it is that the Uthmani text basically it is an aid to the oral transmission it is not enough that a person he simply knows the Arabic language and then he takes up one of the authentic Uthmani text or one of the authentic Qur'ans written in the Uthmani script and then begins to recite rather he has to take it from a teacher to learn how to recite it proficiently again he has to take it from a teacher and learn how to recite it proficiently so just to reiterate it the basis of Quranic transmission is not by the Uthmani text alone again 
the basis of Quranic transmission or the basis of rendition or the basis of preservation is not the Uthmani copy alone. It is not the Uthmani text or what they call the Uthmani Mus'haf. But rather the basis of preservation is recitation via oral transmission. Understand that. So I want that to marinate. Put it in a pot, soak it, let it marinate. Understand what is happening here. Now we're going to look at how it is the Orientalists view this. Now the Bible itself is corrupt and has been shown to be corrupt and you cannot find any kind of scriptural evidence of the bible except if it is written in a language other than the language of isa salam and if they do find something it's a small piece of something a small part of a page probably one eighth the part of a page or something like that that is the reality of it. And he said, he said, he never spoke Greek. From what I know, his people would have spoken Aramaic. So there is no original Bible itself. There is no original Injil. And there is no original vision of the Torah. And seeing that Western civilization um, is based upon, or for example, the spiritual basis of Western civilization is mainly Christianity. The fact that academics examine the textual authenticity of the Bible and did not find it to be authentic, they decided that they have to examine other books as well and although there are codexes or although there are copies of the Quran that date about a hundred years after the Hijra or even um, less than a hundred years after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migrated from Makkah to Medina you find that the Orientalists bring a lot of doubts regarding the textual authenticity of the Quran. Now, the whole thing is that I'm not going to deal with that here because at the end of the day, the most important factor in terms of determining the authenticity of the Quran is oral transmission. And if it is that the oral transmission is congruent or goes with the text and they go hand in hand it shows the strength and the preservation of the quran as allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidun that verily we send the remembrance and verily we are the ones who shall preserve it so the whole thing about it at the end of the day is that you have textual evidence that comes from the first generations of Islam that matches with the oral rendition and the oral transmission of the Quran. So once you have two of them coming together, even in Western historical analysis, that shows that the report itself it is an authentic report. Now we're going into another tangent right now. But let's take it from another angle. So we established two things so far. Number one, that the basis is oral transmission. The basis of rendition of the Quran is oral transmission. And the preservation is oral transmission. Number two, that the text we have, even from the first hundred years or less than a hundred years of Islam, the text we have or the codexes we have with the earth manuscript it matches with our our oral rendition of the quran showing that it is preserved now let us take it further 
I uh, just take the point to the Orientalists. The Orientalists are extremely unfair. And they are extremely biased. And they came with a particular mindset where it is that they have to make Islam look false. They are not people of justice. Orientalism began during the time of Napoleon Bonaparte when it is that he invaded Egypt in the 1790s. And to show you one of the ideas of Orientalism, it is that they want to make sure and put European, in particular Western European white culture, on the highest pedestal. And they want to basically diminish the achievements of any other civilization. How do I know this? When Napoleon invaded Egypt and he saw that the Sphinx had a broad nose and a lot of the statues had broad noses, some of the noses were mysteriously missing. Not due to corrosion because of the fact that the other parts of the statues or the statuettes are still there. Hmm. I wonder what could be the problem. Is it because they were enslaving people who looked just like the people who were building the Sphinx? Or who built the Sphinx and who built the pyramids? Could it be? To the point that the Orientalists tried their utmost best to make the Egyptians look white, Western European. What a joke. So they want to make Western European civilization superior over all other civilizations and want to make sure and diminish the achievements of other empires. And since it is that now under textual scrutiny, they couldn't prove the authenticity, the authenticity of the Bible, they had to go to the Quran. So since the Quran is based upon oral recitation or oral rendition, the first thing that they did was criticize the use of oral rendition. Culprit number one, or criminal number one, or liar number one, is a person named Arthur Jeffrey, who is by no means an Islamic scholar. Orientalists, my dear Muslim brothers and sisters, are not qualified they are not islamic scholars they are not qualified to speak about al-islam al better at all so the whole thing is that arthur jeffrey he wrote books such as materials for the history of the text of the quran and he wrote a book called textual Christ um, history of the quran and he said within the book textual history of the Quran, he said memory, however, is a very treacherous thing. So basically, because of his Eurocentric view and his superiority complex, thinking that Europeans, and you have to remember in this time of Orientalism, it was a time of colonialism, it was a time of eugenics as well, wherein Europeans believed that they were a superior species to the rest of mankind. So, as a result of this, he says memory is a very treacherous thing. How could these Muslims say that their Quran is preserved via oral transmission? So the Eurocentric view or the ethnocentric view regarding oral transmission is to diminish it as much as possible to diminish it as much as possible why because it doesn't go according to their narrative that written history is the only concrete history of course after textual examination so again arthur jeffrey says memory however is a very treacherous thing and MMA Azim, Muhammad Mustafa Azim, he said, 
in the history of Quranic text, page 156, Jeffrey and Gold Zaiha completely ignored the tradition of oral scholarship, the mandate that only through qualified instructors could knowledge be gained. So, to them, there is a gaping hole in the narrative because we orally transmit this knowledge. We orally transmit the basis of our religion. Now, let us go into what modern academia has to say regarding oral history. So, Western academics such as Elizabeth Oakland of University of Arizona, she says, despite primacy be placed on a holy book, this is page 77 of, of our article, and available on the internet, you can just take Elizabeth A. K. A E K L U N D University of Arizona. This is page 77. Despite primacy placed on a holy book, it is common in Abrahamic belief systems to memorize all or part of the sacred text. So the Prophet وسلم, he didn't just go and sit in front of a bonfire and told his companions of this is the Quran and then walked away. It was memorized by the companions. This act of remembering does not allow for change. In other words, it is something rigorous and it is something meant to preserve the particular knowledge. Rather, the memorization of short Bible verses or the recitation of Quran in its entirety is expected to be accurate. And you cannot be called a half of the Quran or a person who memorized the Quran unless you have the Quran accurately. If you memorized it before and you have missed out or your revision is very weak or your Quran is very weak, you cannot be called a memorizer of Quran in Islam. You may have memorized it, but you have to review. So the whole thing about it is that the half of the Quran, he has, it's gone. He has precision regarding the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then she says in page 79, regardless of the strength, I want us to listen to this closely as to what I was saying before. Regardless of the strength in, and I'm trying to see what I wrote here, Allahu Mustaan. Regardless of the strength in documentation, these definitions, meaning European definitions of transmitting knowledge, are deeply hegemonic. They offer no place for memorization, nor a sense of how people can maintain knowledge of their past. And next thing she said, she said on page 80, it is a hegemonic view that people do not or cannot actually memorize or orally transmit accounts across multiple narrators. And she said on page 84, our culture, meaning Euro-American Euro culture, celebrates writing and is deeply hostile. It is deeply hostile to the multiplicity of other ways of knowing and passing on wisdom. So our method in Islam of preserving the Quran, which is based upon oral rendition, recitation, and transmission, Western academia is hostile towards it. Orientalists are hostile towards it, and Yasser Qadi, unfortunately, has taken that particular trajectory. He has taken that trajectory wherein he was asked whether he would write what corresponds to the Quran we have now. Of course, Muhammad Hijab wasn't able to complete his sentence. And Yasser Qadi said that it is not an easy yes or no answer. Okay. But what is it that has been transmitted for the last 1400 years? Isn't it exactly what is contained in the Mus'haf? In the copies? 
So what is the exact problem? Let us go back again according to um, Western circles, Western academic modern day circles. And like Arthur Jeffrey, who said memory is, however, is a very treacherous thing. Now, in an article called Values in Heritage Management, Emerging Approaches and Research Directions, in page 132, it says, The body of literature on authentication within Islamic intellectual heritage is huge and highly sophisticated. However, the assessment of authenticity by conservation professionals within an Islamic context, context doesn't acknowledge 14 centuries of Islamic intellectual heritage on authentication. Intellectual heritage on authentication and our intellectual heritage in terms of Quran is based upon oral transmission. This is perhaps due to the fact that modern conservation theory and practice were initiated in the West and remain Eurocentric. Eurocentric meaning centered upon the ideas and the ideologies of Western Europe to a great extent with little or no awareness or acknowledgement of non-Western intellectual achievements. It is why they wanted to make the Egyptians Western European blue-eyed and blonde-haired when they realized that the Egyptians were black people. Any case, I don't want to digress to that point. This is particularly true in the case of Islam, thanks to a long Western academic tradition of Orientalism. So basically, the dismissal of oral history is mainly a Eurocentric exercise, wherein sophistication, wherein the sophistication and complexity of the Islamic system of oral transmission and recitation of the Quran, it remains unrecognized and unacknowledged. Understand that. So no matter how sophisticated that system of Isnad or having a chain of narration is, no matter how sophisticated it is, it remains unacknowledged and it is not paid attention to. It is cast away in the shadows as something barbaric and something primitive. And another thing, just to comment on Arthur Jeffrey's particular statement on um, memorization where he said memory however is a very treacherous thing I have a comment to make regarding that memory is a very treacherous thing according to western Europe and western Europeans because in our societies we are not accustomed to memorizing. We are accustomed to using textbooks. We are accustomed to using textbooks and notebooks and whatnot. We are not accustomed to memorizing. Evidence for this. When Muslims go to the University of Medina, and I will address Yasser Qadi after this, when Muslims go to the University of Medina, Munawwara, or Makkah, or other universities, Western students tend to get the most problems in academic exercises because we're not accustomed to memorizing. Now I'm going to ask a question. And Yasu Kadi would know this, and many other students from the West would know this. When last has a Western student graduated or has gone into the College of Quran in Medina? When last has a Western student graduated or even had the qualifications to go into the College of Quran in Al-Azhar? When last? When last have you heard of a student born and brought up in the West. When last 
have you heard a student memorize the Quran in the seven or the ten Qur'at? And even brothers who were half of the Quran, they used to run away from the cottage of the Quran because it is the most difficult college. And wallahi, you go into that college, you will find five students, ten students. They have the smallest classes because everybody, everybody is afraid to go in that particular kulia. Everybody is afraid to go in that particular college because it takes a lot of hard work. You have to memorize chapter B here. You have to you have to do the Quran in the different Qur'at. You have to memorize other books. It's it's difficult. It has a high level of difficulty. So we would go in hadith. We would go into Sharia. We would go into Da'wa. Some Two or three would go into Kulita Loga, but nobody would go into Quran. I only know one person as a brother named Diana named Sheikh Shamudin. That's the only person who I know has gone into the Kulita Quran and has graduated from the West. Other than that, I don't know of anybody.